All right, so we're going to continue our look at chapter four, section four, which is the last section of the chapter. And this will be part two of that introduction. Um, and so I'm gonna go through the first dozen or so slides a little bit more quickly, but still go through them for continuity and then focus on more on the later slides in this introduction uh, for the fourth section of chapter four. And recordings for the, uh, the first part and the second part will be posted uh, on Canvas. So we do have four sections here and the first three sections we've looked at on previous classes. Um, and now we are in 4.4, which is about counting techniques. And so I do wanna remind us the idea of what counting has to do with probability. And so we wanna remember that when you're calculating the probability of something, the classical way to determine that probability is to determine the number of ways that event A can happen and divide that like number of ways of A and divide that by the number of ways for anything to happen, any event to happen. And well, both of these situations um, involve counting up something, the number of ways that something can occur or the number of possible ways that things can happen. And so that's why this ends up being about counting um, so that we can then do that. Now we've had simple examples that we've looked at that previously. For example, if I um, flip a coin and I wanna see if I get heads, there's one way to get heads, there's two possibilities. So that's one out of two is my probability. But those were situations where the counting itself wasn't challenging at all and wasn't complicated. But now we're going to begin to look at examples where the different numbers of possibilities are more um, challenging for counting up. And that's why we'll need skills to do that. So in this key concept, there are five different methods for counting that we're going to consider. And that's what's discussed in this section four are these sort of different methods for counting things up. So the first discussion is the multiplication rule. And the multiplication rule is for a sequence of events in which each event has a different number of ways that it might be able to occur. Maybe they're the same number, but that each one is independent from the other. So let's give a simple example to illustrate what this rule is trying to show. Let's say I'm going to pick um, uh, shopping, uh, shopping, uh, pick a shopping list or pick shopping items. And the things I'm going to choose from are I'm going to pick some sort of vegetable in which I have four choices. I'm going to pick some sort of a meal like a we'll just say a frozen dinner I think I said meal there and let's say I have five choices for that and then after that I'm going to pick some sort of a dessert and let's say I have three choices for that so when they're talking about a sequence of events in which each one can occur a different number of ways. I think it's good to think about those as making choices or the different number of possibilities. And so if I'm going to pick a veg and a meal and a dessert, and each of those are successive events, me making those choices, and I've listed the number of ways that each one of those individually can occur, then we want to calculate the total number of possible outcomes meaning what are all the different combinations of veg, meal, and dessert that I can have, then you would calculate that total number of possibilities by multiplying the succession of possibilities of each one together, four times five times three. In this case, for a total of 60 possible menus that you can end up with. So this is what the multiplication counting rule is telling us. And this is a simple example to try to illustrate that. Can someone think of a simple 
example, well, I'm gonna recommend everyone try to think of a simple example and maybe someone will share one of a sequence of events or choices to be made where each one has a different number of ways that can occur and then how we would multiply those to get the total number of outcomes that are possible. Anyone have one they wanna suggest? And please try to think of one even if you don't wanna suggest it. Um, I think a good one would be like uh, clothes in your closet. So like you have five shirts, uh, two or five pairs of pants and six hats or something like that. And so what are the different combinations? Five shirts, five pants, six hats, right? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, that's perfect. Uh, and so you could then say, well, how many different outfits will that produce? How many different possible combinations or outfits would that be? Oh, you wore that pair of pants with that shirt, with that hat. A particular choice for all of those. And if you multiply those together, that means 150 outputs are possible. Because five times five times six is 150. Great example. All right, moving on. So they give us an example about a hacker guessing a passcode. And in this case, there are four digits in the passcode. And each one can be a single digit from zero to nine in which there's 10 possibilities. So I'm gonna briefly show you what this looks like as I would introduce a notational way to think about this and organize it. When there's multiple choices to be made, either it's clothes or food choices, or in this case, numbers for a passcode, I suggest like imagining boxes for each of those choices and that the multiplication principle tells us that or rule is that you multiply the number of ways of each of those successive possible results together to get the total number of possibilities. So if there's 10 different numbers and you have to choose those four times to make a passcode, then the first one you have 10 possibilities, the next one you have 10, the next one you have 10, the next one you have 10. In this case, because you're choosing from the same set of numbers each time, the number of possible choices is the same each time. And so that that leads to a 10 to the fourth or 10,000 possibilities pretty quickly and easily. Now in the earlier example that we were just looking at, the number of possibilities weren't the same each time, but you can still think of the choices being occurred and sort of like, okay, there was four choices, then five choices, then three to choose from. And that that's why we have four times five times three. So in the next slide, they'll do that for us and say, there's 10 possibilities for each digit and you're choosing four of them. So that's 10 times itself four times. But then they extend this to then say, well, what would then be the probability of guessing correctly on the first try? And only one of those guesses would be the exact right code. So that would be one of the ways out of the 10,000 possible or a probability of one out of 10,000. Again, I know this is a little bit rushed. We went more slowly with more examples in more detail um, and we're moving on. So now one specific use of the multiplication rule is when the objects you're choosing from like numbers for um, a passcode, or maybe if I was choosing, I had this big, huge buffet of food and I was choosing things to eat and I was gonna choose three things, but maybe I, I don't need to have veggies separate from desserts. Maybe if I want, I can choose three desserts. Maybe if I want, I can choose three helpings of the same dessert. So there are differences in how, when you make these decisions, what's available to you. And so one of the specific cases that they discuss here is when they refer to what they call a number of different arrangements so when we have a number of different arrangements where order matters of n different items, then they call that the factorial rule and they give this notation n factorial. Factorial is the word for that exclamation mark, or I should say the exclamation symbol is used for factorial in this notation. So what does this rule mean? When you have a number 
that you replace n with like five items and you do five and you put the factorial on it, then this means you use that five in a calculation. And the calculation is that you multiply five times four times three times two times one. So you multiply the number times all the numbers below it down to one, five, four, three, two, one in this case. And that gives you a result. In this case, that would give me 120. So when you see this symbol n factorial, that refers to a calculation using the number n that then gives you a number. And they're telling you by the factorial rule that the number you get is the number of different arrangements in which the order matters. An arrangement is just simply the order in which you list things. So for example, if I have five letters like A, B, C, D, and E, then I could talk about the different ways that I list those. Like I just listed them alphabetically. That's one possible ordering. Or I could do them reverse alphabetically and list them E, D, C, B, A. Or I could switch the letters around. The order would matter. I would get a different sort of word. It wouldn't be official word like defined, but a different sort of spelling with those five letters. And based on this arrangement of these five things, there's 120 different possible arrangements for those five letters. That's what the factorial rule tells us. And you could also think of this with what I was just describing. Imagine that those are five choices to be made and I have my five boxes. So first thing I have to do is which letter comes first when I'm arranging them. And I have five letters to choose from. But now what happens is once I've chosen one of the letters to go first, it's no longer available to go second because I have these five and I'm arranging them. I'm not um, picking, allowed to pick the same letter five times or even twice. So that means when I go to make my second choice from the letters, there's only four remaining to pick from. And then after that, there's three, two, and then the last letter gets picked no matter which one it is. Last letter on the team. So that's where this factorial calculation comes from. The fact that you are ordering things, but because you're choosing from the same things and as you choose them, you don't get to choose them again for a different position in the ordering, then the number goes down each time. So the multiplication rule leads to this formula for the calculation for the different number of possibilities. Again, we went through this in much more careful detail in the earlier video. So in this, they just describe what I just told you. And they do point out that if you use a factorial in a formula and you end up supposedly needing to do zero factorial, that just use zero factorial to be equal to one by a special definition. But other than that, they're just describing what I just showed you here. So they have an example. And I explained it in detail, so I'm going to skip this example, but we're going to see other examples where we use factorials. And there's three slides here. And that gets us to new material. So I just to be clear for a definite delineation, here is where I left off in this morning's uh, discussion, which I spent all the time on, just going more slowly and getting up to this slide here, number 11, and that's where I stopped. So now we are officially picking up with new material in this discussion. And so we have this idea of the multiplication rule and we have this definition of a factorial calculation for arranging objects. So now they give us a definition and a new formula will come with this. Permutations, and there's two things we're gonna compare and contrast, permutations and combinations. And the key concept for these, does order count? So let's, again, these are emboldened, so we have to define them and think about what they mean. Permutations of items are arrangements in which different sequences of the same items are counted separately. And so they're giving letter arrangements, which I was just discussing, the letter arrangements of A, B, C, A, C, B, B, A, C, et cetera, are all counted separately as six different permutations. So what they're saying is, if you took those three letters, 
A, B, C, and you talked about all the different ways that you could order those, that that's an example of a permutation. And from our previous discussion, that's also an example of an arrangement. I'm arranging the three letters, so I would use this factorial rule for three items. And so the number of arrangements would be three factorial, which is three times two times one, which is six. So that's how the factorial calculation can quickly tell you how many different ways something can be arranged. And that's called permutations. Now, in this case, they listed them. And you can see from these right here that there's six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And this calculation with the factorial rule told us that there should be six. That's how many different ways you can arrange three items, whether they're letters or whatever. Questions, comments, discussions about that? Now we went, we got to this point pretty quickly. So if you're feeling left behind because I went a little too quick so that we could move forward from here, that's understandable. Let's take some time to discuss this a little bit if we can. And let me recommend that you try to think of an example of arranging something. I've given the example of letters. Try to think of something in which you would arrange things that would form a permutation and what the calculation would be for arranging all of those items. And if you're willing to share it, then please offer a suggestion. But either way, try to think of one. Any suggestions? Yes, you, you could do like uh, uh, soccer players or, or like a, a team player or team, team sport uh, with the amount of players that they have, like how many people can play and how many different positions, if they can all play the different positions. Okay, so let's say yes, that let's say that the, that for simplicity's sake with what we've discussed so far, that you have, what's there, 10 players on a soccer team? Uh, 11. 11, thank you. That you have these 11 players and let's say there's 11 different unique positions so that they're all separate, so that the ordering of which positions. So who gets assigned to which unique position would be an example of a permutation. Because the order matters, because if you get assigned to the first position, that's not the same as if you get assigned to the fifth position. And that would be an example where the number of different possible team assignments to those 11 positions would be 11 factorial is the number that you would use to calculate the, the formula you would use. So that's a great example. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, if, if for example, three of those positions are all the same, like, you know, maybe there's three forwards or something like that, where, well, then, the calculation would be very similar, but we would need to modify it a little bit. And that's coming up in a formula in a few slides from now. So we want to begin with these basic ideas and some simple examples, but we're then going to expand beyond that and to go into more complicated examples as well, which is the big challenge of this section. All right, so that was a good example. So there's a second slide here. And that's for the combinations. So we're gonna compare permutations to combinations. Combinations of items are arrangements in which different sequences of the same items are counted as being the same. The letter arrangements of A, B, C, and the six different possibilities are all considered to be the same combination. So what does that mean? So the, I'm gonna give you a phrase and introduce a phrase here that encapsulates the difference between permutations 
and combinations. It's the idea they say, does order count? Meaning, do you count different orderings? Or the question really will be, is does order matter? So let's talk about people for a second. So let's say I'm going to choose from a, um, from a group of people, three people, and because these three people are going to serve as president, vice president, and secretary of some organization that we're, we have. So that's a case in which the order matters because whether you're president, vice president, or secretary, it makes a difference. Just like the example we just had with the assigning team members onto positions on a team which position you get matters, so the order matters. So if I've got a bunch of people and I'm picking three positions and I'm filling them that where the three positions are unique, then order matters. That's an example, like we saw with the team selection of permutations. So I'm gonna contrast that with an example of selecting three people in which order would not matter. So let's say of my organization, instead of picking people to fill specific positions like president, vice president, and secretary, I'm picking three people to serve on a committee. Well, then it still matters which three people got chosen because then you'll know whether you're on the committee or not. But the order in which the three people were chosen doesn't matter. It only matters which three were chosen. So in one case, I care which people become president, vice president, and secretary. So it's which three individuals they are and the order matters because which, which not only do I pick the three people, but I assign them to different positions. And that's where those six different position orderings matter. But if I just take those three people and then they all get the same position, they're all on a committee, well, then it doesn't matter which order in which I picked them. Did I pick Joe, then Sue, then Frank? Or did I pick Sue, then Frank, then Joe? Well, it doesn't matter because it's still those same three people, three people on the committee. So for combinations, the basic idea is that order does not matter. Where with permutations, it does. And the reason we want to distinguish these is because there's going to be a formula for how to calculate the possible ways that you can make those choices, depending on whether you have permutations, you'll have one formula, and depending on whether you have combinations, you'll have a slightly different formula and get a different result. So before we get lost in the formulas, can we just understand this conceptual difference? So here is the context for permutations and combinations. You have a group you're choosing from, group of people, group of letters, group of anything. You're choosing something from the group. And one of the things that matters to be choosing something from the group is that you can't use the same thing you choose more than once. One person cannot serve in two positions on a committee. You're either on the committee or you're not. You can't be on there twice. One person cannot serve as the president and also serve as the vice president. You only get one role, if any. So in both the cases for computations and permutations, we, we choose from the group and we say it's without replacement or without repetition. So let me go back to earlier example to illustrate that. When we looked at the number of ways to make a combination lock, we used 10 every time because each time you chose a digit for your combination, you could choose from any one of the, the 10 numbers. And it's possible you would choose the same number twice. So one combination code might be one, two, three, four, but another combination code might be seven, 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 seven. 
And so when the same value or the same item can be used more than once, then you say that that's with possible repetition or with replacement of the choices of what you get to pick from. When we removed that replacement, as we saw with the factorial rule, then all of a sudden the number started counting down each time. And when that happened, then we say that's without replacement or without repetition. For permutations and combinations, both of these will be without replacement, without repetition. And then one of them will be order matters and the other one order does not matter. So I'm going to now put these together and highlight the two sort of key simple things to think about when trying to count up possibilities of things. One is it with or without replacement or repetition? If it's with replacement, then that's not a permutation, that's not a combination, that's not a factorial. That's gonna be something where you might have the same number in each case, like 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. But if you do not have replacement, if it's without replacement, then the next thing to think about is, does order matter? And the, and the idea with does order matter, is it then going to be permutations or combinations? Order matters means permutations. Order does not matter, it means combinations. So let's try a couple uh, or maybe at least one simple example, maybe a couple that I give you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna describe a situation to you and ask you to determine in the situation, is it with or without replacement and does order matter? And we won't worry about how the calculation would be done, but if you were counting, doing these counting techniques for a particular situation, how you would come to decide these two questions. All right. So I, uh, here's my procedure, and then we're gonna count up, imagine counting up the possibilities. I've got a bag of letter tiles, like Scrabble tiles or something like that. And there's uh, one letter for each letter in the alphabet. So there's 26 tiles in the bag, and I dump them on the bag and I shake them up. Okay, and here's the procedure I'm gonna use. I'm going to pick out a tile and look at the letter and I'm gonna write that letter down. Then I'm gonna put the tile back in the bag. Then I'm gonna shake them up and I'm gonna pick out a, a letter from the 26 and I'm gonna write that letter down and I'm gonna put it back in the bag. And I'm gonna do that five times. So in the end, I'm gonna have five letters written down, whatever letters I pulled out of the bag in each of those five successive pulls. So that's the situation. First question, if I'm counting up all the different possible five letter things that I would have, five letter words for lack of a better word, they may not spell anything, but five letter spellings that I would end up have written on the paper after pulling out the letters five times. When I'm trying to count up the possibilities, is that with or without replacement? Discussion, questions, suggestions? What do you guys think? Well, I don't know if I'm right, uh, but I will say like uh, with replacement, maybe you can replace that letter uh, from another one from the, from the same bag. Yeah, so in this case, I tried to use that example because I'm physically, literally replacing the letters after each choice so that you can make this connection to reality. And the key difference in this situation and what replacement or not replacement is trying to get at 
is when you have your succession of items, could you have repetition? In other words, if I have my five letter word, could I get, you know, A, 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 A? Well, since every time I pulled out a letter, I put it back. If I got an A the first time and I put it back and shook it up, I could conceivably get an A the next time too. And I could keep getting A's. It's not likely, it's gonna be a very low probability, but it could happen. That is one of the possibilities. So the idea of with or without replacement or repetition is when you're thinking of your succession of things, could you have the same thing repeated multiple times? What do you guys think about that? So this is a key concept. And these two things are usually going to be the number, the main way that you think about and approach analyzing a word problem in this section to come up with the right answer when you do your calculation. These are the key things. So we have to think about being described a situation, whether we could answer these questions. And if we can answer them correctly, we've our chances of getting the problem right, you know, go up by 100%. I should say double. Okay, now, does order matter? Now, this won't be a permutation or a combination because permutations and combinations are both only for things that are without replacement or without repetition. But still we wanna answer, does order matter? No. So if I pick A, B, C, D, E, that would be five letters that I chose that I then wrote out that spelling as I picked them. If I pick the E first and then put it back, and then the D next and then put it back, and then wrote down E, D, C, B, A, is that the same result? Yes. So I don't think so. I don't think so. I think the situation I described order matters because what I said is I'm writing them down as I go. And I want to know what kind of word or what kind of spelling I get. And as you may know from English, I before E except after C, la da 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 da. When you spell words, the order of the letters matter. Spellings change and you have a different spelling when the order of the letters are different. Now, I could describe a similar situation in which order did not matter. But the one that I described, order definitely mattered. It's, so like, you... it's like when you are playing um, Scrabble and it's like you want to have like the, the order of the, of the letters because you want to you wanna, um, create a word then. So... Well, that, I, I hope enough people have enough familiarity with Scrabble that it's a helpful example. That's not always the case. The same with cards. But in Scrabble, you have a different situation than what I described. And let's think about the difference because that'll help us understand this about order mattering. Well, first of all, when you're doing Scrabble, you don't take a letter and then put it back in the bag and then take out another letter, right? You grab five letters. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah. And when you, and you may take them out one at a time, but you don't put them back and then draw again. And so for that reason, if I was pulling out tiles like in Scrabble, just one, two, three, four, five, then that would be number one without replacement. And also when I just look and I just say, okay, which five letters did I get? And I can rearrange the order later if I want. Well, then I don't care the order in which I got those five letters. I only care which five I got because I'm just collecting the five and then I can reorder them later. That is totally different than the situation I described. So in the situation I described, you pull letters one at a time and then you put them back and you write them down in the order that you pulled them out. So the order in which you pulled out those letters matters and it was with replacement because you put them back so you could get the same letter more than once. But if I pull them out and don't put them back and I just look at which five did I get and I don't put them in a particular order, then all of a sudden it's without replacement and order does not matter. 
And so if I just said, if I'm pulling Scrabble tiles from a bag of 26, how many different sets of five letters could I get? That would be a combination calculation. And there's gonna be a formula that will be used very quickly that'll tell us how many different five letter groups you could pull from a bag. So that's a perfect discussion to try to illustrate these, but maybe I lost you. So initially people were not recognizing correctly whether order matters or not. So questions, comments, discussions about that? All right, so there's a lot to think on. And that's a, so we just looked at two situations where I'm literally taking letters out of a bag and I'm gonna end up with having pulled five letters. And in the first situation, it was with, with replacement and order mattered. And then in the second situation, it was without replacement and order didn't matter. And you could do any combination of those. Like I could have it without replacement and order does matter. So for example, I'm pulling the letters out of the bag and as I pull them out, I write down which letter I get, but I don't put the letter back. So then that would be without replacement, but order does matter. And I just say, well, what letter did I spell by the order in which I pulled them out? Did I spell A, B, C, D, E? Or did I spell something different like B, A, D, C, A? B, A, D, C, E. In that case, that would be without replacement, but order would matter. And then we would use a permutation calculation formula to determine how many different words or letter spellings I would get by pulling them out one at a time without putting them back. All right, over most people's heads, I'm sure. Hopefully this will get you thinking in the right way. So they try to give you a little helpful mnemonic here. Remember permutations position, where the alliteration reminds us that with permutations, the positions of the items makes a difference in terms of counting up the different ways things can happen. And combinations committee, I described a situation of choosing three people and forming a committee because that's a nice good example of combinations. So they're trying to connect the two together because when you choose a committee, rearrangements of the same members results in the same committee. So the order in which you choose the people doesn't matter. Permutations, position, combinations, committee. Hopefully that helps. So here's the formulas. Now the formulas are very similar to each other and we have to understand the notation and notice that it has this little factorial symbol in it. So this is idea that we use factorials to do these things. And so you will, when you're getting to the point where you're doing a formula like this, you would like to have a calculator that at least had the factorial symbol on it. That's usually true for just about every $10 Walgreens type of scientific calculator. Sometimes the factorial symbol is like uh, above a key, like written above it and you have to use shift and use that. So you might have to figure out how to do that. Um, the, it's on the Windows calculator. So if you're using Windows, I assume it's on a Apple, built-in Apple calculator, a Mac calculator as well, but I don't use Macs, so I don't know. But anyway, we will see this in action, but the n factorial means the n times n minus one counting down five times four times three times two times one. And so we have this formula. So let me give you an example of what these letters mean and what it looks like. So the P stands for the permutations. N is the number of items in the group that you're choosing from like the 26 letters. And R is the number of the number of the items that you're selecting, like I chose five letters. And when you know the number you're choosing from and that you're how many you're choosing and that it's a permutation, then you would plug those numbers N and R into the formula to tell you how many ways that choice can be made, the different number of possibilities. So in the example that we were discussing, let's say n is equal to 26 letters to choose from, and r is equal to five letters to be chosen. Now, which was the situation that would lead to permutations? 
where it was without replacement. So I chose a letter and I don't put it back. And for permutations, order matters. So that means that as I picked out the letter, I wrote it down. And then the second letter got, letter got written down second, the third letter got written down third, and then I look at the spelling that I got. So how many different spellings of five letters chosen one at a time from a bag without replacement where order matters? Well, according to this formula, I would write P and I would write 26 here and five here. That's the notation you would use. And it's sometimes referred to as the permutations of five objects chosen from 26 or 26 permute five, things like that. But the formula that you would use Oops. is 26 factorial, which is a very big number, divided by 26 minus 5 factorial. So in the parentheses is 26 minus 5. If I do that subtraction first, then I get 26 factorial divided by 21 factorial. And that's something you can type on a calculator. So questions about what this notation and this formula are telling you to do when you use it to make a calculation? Um, this doesn't directly have to do with this, but like this problem, but um, we won't get any words like insanely large numbers, right? Uh, you can get huge, large, huge numbers. Absolutely. Okay. Millions, billions. Absolutely. Okay. All right. So Alex is asking about what would you get as an answer so that uh, I could pull out of my sharing to do a calculator, but instead I'm going to show you how you could even do this on a standard normal calculator. So what does 26 factorial mean? What does this mean? That means 26 times 25 times 24. And I do that all the way down to one. So I'm gonna keep going a little bit. 23, 22, 21, 20, 19. And then I'm gonna go dot, dot, dot. That's the number in top of the fraction. That's what 26 factorial means. Are we okay so far? Yeah, that makes sense. Yes, yeah. Okay, All right, well, what does 21 factorial mean? It's the same thing, but you don't start at 26, you start at 21. So if I wrote on the bottom of the fraction, 21, oops, 21 times 20 times 19, etc. Then all of those numbers would be multiplied on the bottom. Well, when you have fractions, all factors multiplied in the top and the bottom, you can cancel out common factors. Yeah, I was going to say, wouldn't 21 through 1 all disappear? Exactly. So what this calculation ends up meaning is that you multiply these five numbers together. Over 1, and then you get I think seven. <laughs> Still a big number. Seven million eight hundred ninety three six hundred. All right. Eight hundred ninety three. Yeah. Six hundred. Yep. Well, if you can imagine, if you think of all the different five letter combinations you could get when you have 26 to choose from and you just pull them out in order, there should be a lot of those. <laughs> right. And in this case, there's millions of different five letter words that you could spell when you have 26 letters to choose from and you take five of them one at a time. Now, you can also think of this as I was discussing earlier in reflection of just a more complicated application of the multiplication rule. As I was saying before, with the multiplication rule, you have a, successive, you have a succession of choices to make. Well, if I'm picking five letters, then I'm gonna have different ways that I can get those. How many choices do I have for the first letter out of the bag? 26. 
Well, when I go to pick the second letter, I've removed one of them. So then I have 25 and then 24 and 23 and 22. But then I stop because I'm only picking five letters. And that gives you the exact same calculation. Does that make sense? Now, if you're picking 12 letters out of the bag, then you may not wanna on your calculate type 26, 25, 20, 12 times and multiply those together when you can just do a little factorial formula and do 26 factorial over uh, 14 factorial. So that way, the, the, this version here makes it much easier when both numbers might be big and you wanna do it on a calculator. And so I would suggest that you you recognize that you could multiply those five letters to numbers together, or you could do this calculation on a calculator and you should get the exact same answer. Questions, comments, discussions about that? Okay, well then they give you the, the formula for combinations. And here, what I'm gonna tell you is that the combinations formula is almost identical to this one. It just adds an R factorial on the bottom for combinations. So if we move to the next page, where they do that, well, I guess it's not the next word. They do an example first. They show an example and then they, in that case had 19 things and they chose three of them and there were 5,800 ways that could happen. Um, I'm gonna skip this rule. So we are down to literally the last couple of minutes. So let me just show, get to the combination formula. You can see there's just so much stuff here. So if you notice the combination rule, which they show as their final strategy or sort of rule for doing combination, for doing counting techniques. All they did was they added this R factorial on the bottom. And so both the permutations calculation and the combinations calculation um, are very similar. The formulas are very similar. The combination one has an extra thing on the bottom. So lastly, I'm gonna just put this in front of you this thing here. Their fourth rule here is when you are arranging permutations, but certain numbers of the things that you're doing, um, actually the order that you pick those don't matter. And here's a formula for that. So the reason I wanted to end with this is because this goes back to the example. This is the formula we would use for picking the people on the soccer team. So I forget who asked about that, but can you tell me on a soccer team, are there positions that are not unique? Like are there forwards that are all the same of the 11 people or something like that? I mean, usually a player will only play two or three positions. Uh, and then each, uh, some players can play more than one position, but some players can only play one position because it's like their specialty. I mean, there's more, uh, right. But what I'm saying is, let's say you're making your team of 11 people and you're picking a position for a person. So is there, when you have 11 people, are all 11 positions unique or are some of them the same position? Some of them should be the same position. Like, are there, like, more, is there more than one forward or something like that? I don't know the right. Um, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't understand. Yeah. Does that make sense? So, so what is the details of that? Three forwards or something or what? Um, goalie. Yeah, there's goalie, defense, offense, and then there's someone in the middle to start off the game. Okay, so there's so there's a goalie is one. Uh, no, normally it's four, four, three, three, four in the back, three in the middle, three up top. Okay, so then here's how you would calculate all the different ways you could assign teammates to that position. There's 11 people being chosen from, so that's 11 factorial, but four, three, three of those positions are not unique, meaning you just care which four people you got for those positions, but the order in which you pick them doesn't matter because all those, it's just that same group of four. So then you would literally divide by those subcategories, factorials, 
that didn't matter. And so if I do this calculation, then that'll tell me how many different teams of the, of the, how many different arrangements of the 11 players on a team can be made and how many different soccer teams can be formed with the same three players. I'm sorry, with the same 11 players. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, we're out of time. Uh, so please feel free to take off if you need to. I'm gonna show you an example of one problem that I did set aside on the homework and I'm gonna keep the video running while I do that to illustrate this formula here, just so we can see how the things we're discussing in the slides, the examples we're using do relate directly to our homework. And so I'm gonna just keep this going a little bit longer. So, and if you need to go by all means, of course. So I'm going to hop over to the homework and I think it was like 18. So I'm going to go to homework number four, not due till next week and look at number 18. So it's very simple. It just says how many different ways can the letters of the word committee be arranged? So I'm going to have to make my writing look much worse as I use my mouse to write. And it already looked bad when I had a nice pen on my tablet. So this is a situation where you have this, you're going to fill each of these positions with a letter. And so these are the number of positions to be filled, but you, for example, the C can't be used twice. Um, and so this is without replacement and the order matters because when you rearrange the letters, you get a different spelling of some, maybe something that is a word or something is no longer a word, but it's a different spelling. So order matters, it's without replacement, that makes it a permutation. But there are some of these letters that are repeated. So if I use one M in one position and then another M in the other position, the order of those two didn't matter because they were just the same letter. The order of the two T's, the order of the two E's didn't matter. So that's an example of that formula that we were just looking at, or that's like filling a soccer team where the four people that are all in the front or whatever, it doesn't matter which or which because those are all interchangeable. These M's are interchangeable, the T's and the E's are interchangeable. So how many do I have here all together? Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Looks like there's nine positions here. So this would be nine factorial. That would be, if all of these were unique, different things, then there would just be nine different, nine factorial different arrangements of those nine letters. But because some of them don't matter how you arrange them because they're not unique, then I would divide by those situations. One is for the M's, that's two factorial. Oops. And then I also have two T's. So that's another two where order for those don't matter. That's another two factorial. Oh, this is terrible. And then I have two E's. So that's another two factorial. So there's nine spots, order matters. It's without replacement, but for three pairs, order doesn't matter. And so as I was mentioning, you can, write this out and simplify, but if you can somehow come up with a calculator and most of them should have this, um, I'm just gonna show in the Windows calculator, then often they'll have a factorial symbol here. So I could do this calculation by saying nine factorial, which is a big number, and two factorial is just two times one. So I can say divided by two factorial, and when I hit factorial, it's just gonna show me two factorial is two, which means I'm gonna just divide by two each time, which, or I could have just divided by eight. And then that gives me an answer, 45, 360. So this is uh, number 18 from the homework. And so really the thing to understand about this was that you had to recognize how many things were being drawn from, is it with or without replacement, does order matter? And in this case, some of the order mattered, but some of them didn't. And that's when you get that formula four on the slides 
to deal with situations like this. But once you're able to select the correct tool or formula, then the problem becomes pretty easy to do. The hard part is in the analysis of the situation. So I'm gonna stop recording there. But I will, of course, as usual,